All right. Well, welcome. My name, my name is Gary Wamser. I'm an attorney with North Penn Legal Services. And uh, we invite you here tonight to participate in a clinic on bankruptcy. Um, all of you have called our office and asked certain questions about debtors and creditors and debt situations and raised the possibility of bankruptcy might help you in solving those problems. Um, I'd like to open it up. I know you had a number of specific questions about different kinds of property or different kinds of debt. And um, if you have uh, questions about those, we could um, try and give you an answer. Yes? What is bankruptcy in general? I mean... Okay. Good, good question. I mean, most people always, you hear it in such not negative connotation, and then people say bankruptcy can work for you. So right. what do you say about the two different messages? Well, I guess bankruptcy is in the news these days because of Enron. But uh, what a bankruptcy uh, is is actually a procedure that was authorized in the Constitution. Uh, it's a federal law uh, authorized by Congress to help people who are in over their heads financially people, corporations, or whatever. But there is a, 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 a version of the bankruptcy law that is available to consumers. Uh, and uh, because the collection process is usually a function of state law, uh, the bankruptcy law trumps that state law and affords relief to people that are in over their heads uh, as a matter of federal law. Two re key concepts of bankruptcy law is to provide relief from creditors and to give you a fresh start. Now again, how it works for you individually depends on debts, what debts you have and what property you have. I think you, for example, had a question about child support. Yes. Um, the amount of money I pay my ex-wife for child support is astronomical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Paying my debts is very difficult. What can I do? I mean, is there an yeah. umbrella that I can find well, again, A bankruptcy can affect a number of different kinds of debts. There are some debts, though, that you cannot discharge in bankruptcy. Child support, alimony, those kind of payments are one of them. Those are debts that must be paid even if um, you file for bankruptcy. But you may find those other kinds of debts which are weighing you down, which make it more difficult, that you can discharge and thereby having more money to satisfy living needs plus pay the support. Um, how fast is the process? Okay, well, let me take a stab at, at that. Um, the, the work that goes into a bankruptcy is, is really in at the front of the bankruptcy. Uh, so gathering up the information, which is a rather extensive disclosure of, of your financial circumstances, where you've worked, what you've earned over the last couple of calendar years, what you have in terms of assets, uh, those, your income and expenses, those kinds of things are looked at. And it takes a lot of preparation to do those things if you do them thoroughly and, and correctly. But once the bankruptcy is filed, the time frame is relatively routine in, for example, a, a Chapter 7, or it's called a straight bankruptcy or a liquidation bankruptcy, where you're not proposing any payment. You're going into the court to lose debt. Generally speaking, uh, Within uh, a month or two of your filing, there'll be what's called a creditor's meeting that you need to attend. Uh, it's a, generally a painless process, but it's just to, to give some official of the bankruptcy court the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face the person that's filing bankruptcy and to uh, get that person to verify that the facts in their extensive paperwork are true and correct. Uh, there may be some uh, minor uh, paper proceedings that follow the creditor meeting, but the point of the Chapter 7 bankruptcy is to get a discharge order from the bankruptcy court. And that's usually issued within, uh, I would say, three to five months from the filing date. One thing they have to recognize that's very important, when you go to bankruptcy court, the day you file, the court stops any creditor action against you. From that time on, all your debts have to be dealt with through the bankruptcy court, and they can only take action concerning those debts in the bankruptcy court. That protection is one of the most important parts about filing for bankruptcy. And uh, that's immediately upon filing. It's in that period of time between mm -hmm. um, actually declaring bankruptcy, mm -hmm. uh, starting the process and declaring it, is there something that I could tell all the, the phone calls and the letters that I keep getting? Anything I can do with that? Yeah, usually when, when a creditor, when you file for bankruptcy, you have to give notice to all of your creditors. It's one of the requirements. Once they know 
then they know they can only deal with you through the bankruptcy court. Now, when you file for bankruptcy, it's almost like a snapshot as of that day. And the debts that are incurred before that time are going to be treated through the bankruptcy. Debts that you incur after that time on a regular basis, uh, utility bills, rent, those you pay and take care of on a regular basis. When you file for bankruptcy, do they put your name in the newspaper? Yes, they probably do. I mean, it, it just seems like they're trying to embarrass you. No, the idea is that you want to do it on a public basis, so any creditor is going to deal with you through the bankruptcy. If you don't list a creditor and he doesn't know about it, that debt is not taken care of through the bankruptcy. It's a public process. Okay. Before the next question, I wanted just to jump in on the time frame. Uh, we talked about the time frame for a Chapter 7 or straight liquidation bankruptcy. Uh, there is another type of bankruptcy, which is called a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, which is generally available to consumers. And the Chapter 13 plan usually lasts uh, at least 36 months and can go on for up to five years, depending on the specifics and how much debt you're trying to handle by a payback plan in the Chapter 13 bankruptcy. What are you trying to pay back through a 13? Probably the most uh, common is if people fall behind on their mortgage. What you can do with a Chapter 13 bankruptcy is say, what I want to do is come into court, pay my current mortgage, and catch up on the arrearages spread out over time. If you were trying to do that with the bank, the bank could turn you down. The bankruptcy court can make them accept a payback plan so you can keep your house. Okay. I have a question in regards, um, you were talking about a chapter 7 and yes. a chapter 13. 13. Yes. Um, none of those are for big companies or anything. This is just strictly for the consumers? Well, for, you know, person, individuals? Yes. Now, there's two, there are four different chapters. Um, and I, one of them, for example, a 12 is for family farms. We're not going to cover that here. It's a special area, and none of you are farmers. Uh, chapter 11 would be for business reorganization primarily. 13 and 7 are for consumers. S 7 is where you want primarily to liquidate your, your debts. A 13 is where there's specific kind of debts, like the house payment, where you want to catch current so you can keep the asset. Thank you. Chapter 7 is also available to corporations that are going out of business. If they're not reorganizing, but they're liquidating, they can file Chapter 7. And not to, to nitpick, but there is another chapter that we, we never see, which is uh, Chapter 9, which is a uh, municipality can file bankruptcy, as was done in Orange County, California, a few years back. But that's really obscure stuff. Well, my question in that regard is that I see so many commercials uh, about credit counseling and so on. And because of the amount of money that I make, I've heard you know, this is one of the first places where I've come to get some sort of relief. I've mm -hmm. heard that I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be eligible to go through their program. Um, so I'm just thinking, is there, is there a way that I would know when I'm accepted for bankruptcy? I have to go through all that paperwork or uh. can I be rejected? Can I say, no, you have too much money, you just haven't managed it well enough? Hmm. Is that what the credit counseling people are telling you? Uh, that's one of the screening questions. If I have, I don't have that much debt, and I have so much of an income, mm -hmm. you know, th right. are they going to freeze my assets? Is it better for me to go to bankruptcy? So okay. that's well, what I would like to know. You, there's lots of questions in your question, and I'm not sure uh, how to handle all of them, but I, I will say this. There is a good faith requirement in the bankruptcy code, which has been uh, looked at more and more as the, the current bankruptcy law has become more and more used to give relief to, to people in distress. And uh, I'll use uh, two examples. One of the things that you have to give the bankruptcy court is a uh, statement of income and expenses. Now, if you are in the bankruptcy court and you're showing income way over your expenses, that's an invitation, perhaps, for uh, an official called the United States trustee to look very closely at your situation and object to your getting relief in the bankruptcy court. Right? Uh, the other place where that uh, comparison of income to expenses is important 
is in if you're in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy where you're actually in a paying bankruptcy. Now we haven't talked about the advantages or the, the usefulness of Chapter 13 as compared to Chapter 7. It has to do with whether or not your creditors have interests in your property like your car or your mortgage in a, in a home. But you are going to be required to pay into the bankruptcy court for the length of your Chapter 13 plan the difference between what you need to survive and what you have in surplus income. So in that context, if you were going to go into Chapter 13, for example, where a credit counseling agency may say, no, you can't, it may be that you can do that in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy. It, but it's without more specifics, it's really hard to yeah. say whether that makes more sense or not. I'd recommend you go, go to the counseling agency, see what they offer. I mean, what they can often do is work out ways that you can pay your debts without going through bankruptcy. There are some times when that just doesn't work, and bankruptcy is just another alternative. I would consider both. Yeah, I, I would say that the, the existence of the bankruptcy gives the credit counseling agencies leverage because the creditors know that if they don't compromise their claims through a credit counseling agency, they will be forced to have their claims either uh, discharged or compromised in a bankruptcy. And a bankruptcy is not free. Uh, oddly enough, there was a Supreme Court decision in the 1920s that made bankruptcy one of the only types of proceedings that you can't file with a waiver of court costs. And the costs are significant. The filing fee for a Chapter 7 uh, is about $200 right now. And the filing fee for a Chapter 13 is $180. So on that basis alone, if you can get relief through a credit counseling agency, which is a free service, maybe that's the way to go. Okay. Um, would you be talking tonight at some chance exactly what would be the benefit? For example, I have a student loan. I have a car that I'm paying on. I have a house. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I figure with, uh, in contrary to somebody else that doesn't have a, their own home. Yeah, and again, it all depends. Mm -hmm. on, on houses, for example, one of the key, key things, you can save equity in a house as an individual of 15000 And that basically means if you sold the house and paid off the mortgage, if the amount you would walk away with is less than 15000 no other creditor can go after it. That's yours. And you only have to deal with the bank. If you owned a 100000 home free and clear, um, obviously that home would probably have to be sold to uh, pay the creditors. So you'd have to look at your own specific situation. Again, we talked about some debts that are non-dischargeable. The, the um, uh, child support is a non-dischargeable debt. You can't get out of it through bankruptcy. Student loans are another one which are very hard to discharge in bankruptcy. It has to be a hardship, and the court has to specifically find some hardship before someone is let out of a student loan, and it's very rare. Uh, taxes are another type of loan that, again, are not are not easy to get out of through a bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Sorry, a few. I was going to say uh, the student loan was uh, a a big loophole when the bankruptcy law was passed in 1978, uh, and Congress quickly moved to make it harder to discharge student loans because there were some awful stories about uh, people making lots of money in their postgraduate professions, like doctors discharging their, their uh, medical school debt. Uh, up until the most recent bankruptcy amendment, there's been a progressive tightening of the dischargeability of student loans. So that uh, there were time frames that were, there, now it's just the only basis to get a student loan discharged is undue hardship if you pay it. And it's basically hard to do because most of the student loan lenders uh, will bend over backwards to say, uh, Whatever you can send us, we'll take. Uh, we won't let you out of the loan. Who actually qualifies? Um, say I only own a vehicle, I rent, I'm a single parent, and I got over my head with credit cards. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I file bankruptcy? You could file bankruptcy. The question would be, would you want to? One of the things we look at is whether you have assets at risk. If again, let's say you're in debt or head over heels over credit cards, and maybe you lost a job, went through a period where you were disabled, and couldn't make the payments, and now they're going to sell your car, and you need it for work, then you could go to bankruptcy and save the car. You know? um, every, every creditor is, debtor is entitled to 
save certain things from other creditors. I mentioned 50, 15,000 equity in a house. It's actually, Gary, it's, it's been raised. Raised now? Yeah, they, they peg the, the exemptions to uh, a, a sliding scale, and it, it increases in time. It's up to over $17,000 now. All right, how about for a car? Uh, car is around uh, 28, I think, then. A little bit. No, no, 20, I don't know. I have to, I brought so, the book. I can look. You tell me. I'll look. <laughs> Basically, if you're a car worth roughly $2,800, again, uh, the only creditor you really have to worry about is the one you're p buying the car from. Other creditors won't be able to take the car. Again, if it's worth $2,800 or less. Okay. Um, you can save household goods and furnishings. The last time I looked, Joey's going to check it out, was about $8,000 worth of household goods and possessions. Most people who come on our office, if you tried to sell most of their household goods and possessions, aren't going to let raise $8,000, right? Um, okay, uh, the, the equity in the home is now increased to $17,425. Uh, the interest in an automobile is $2,775. The interest in household goods is nine thousand three hundred dollars, and uh, anyway, so it's, they're quite generous as compared to the state law exemptions, which are three hundred dollars plus your Bible and your sewing machine and your clothing. A lot of people find that the main debt they're really getting rid of is, of course, credit card debt, and once they do that, then they can strip down to the basic mortgage or rent, car payment, you know, utility payments. Um, the basic things they need to, to live day to day. Um, and often that's what the court sees as a fresh start. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, I received I received a uh, letter in the mail mm -hmm. uh, from the car company. And it said, um, I only owe about $6,000, and they said if I gave them $3,000, it would wipe out the debt. Mm -hmm. Is that part of this whole thing as far as bankruptcy is concerned? or I well, don't understand that, quite frankly. Can I take a look? Go. Uh, there's a provision in the bankruptcy law which is very powerful and generally helpful to creditors. And it has to do with the type of creditor that you're dealing with. Uh, we didn't talk about that too much, but many creditors have no security. People who give you car loans often will take an interest in your vehicle. And vehicles are a good example of where this bankruptcy provision is helpful because uh, a car depreciates so quickly. If you buy even a, a used car uh, within the year after you buy it, it's going to be a lot less valuable than the contract price that you paid for it. All right. The bankruptcy law takes a claim like that and, and divides it into two different types of claim, the unsecured claim and the secured claim. And what the bankruptcy law says is a claim is secured to the extent that the collateral has value. Uh, in an example, if you bought a car for $10,000 and uh, fell behind on the payments because of uh, lo loss of job or disability, uh, two years later your car may be worth $5,000, but your debt may be still up around $10,000. In the bankruptcy uh, analysis, uh, the lien on your vehicle would only have up to the value of the car. So. Uh, you could either pay that $5,000 in a Chapter 13 plan, which is called a cram down, or if you had a rich uncle with $5,000, you could pay that creditor the $5,000 and keep that car in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy uh, through a procedure which is called redemption. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so that's maybe what's going on with what your creditor's offering you, uh, but Again, in bankruptcy, you have pretty well three choices. You can redeem the car, pay off the value, reaffirm the debt, continue to pay the debt so you keep the car, or return the car because you just can't make payments. Okay, so then what I understand about, or what I don't understand about Chapter 13, it, it sounds to me like it's a way for me to take all of my debts, consolidate them mm -hmm. in a sense, um, so that it's not too much for me to carry on a monthly basis. And still pay point. off. I don't want to get rid. I don't want to be irresponsible with my debts. Sure. But I can't. I can't do it. Well, you can. You can look. You can put different debts in different categories. For example, those debts that are secure, like the mortgage on the house, you can say, "I'll pay that full," right? Because you need to in order to keep the house. There are other kind of debts, which are credit card debts, which are unsecured, and those you can choose not to pay through the Chapter 13. You can focus your money 
on saving the important property. And the court can approve that plan. If you can show a budget that shows you have enough income to meet your living expenses and meet, meet the uh, mortgage payments, they'll approve the plan and, and the bank will have to accept it. Yeah, the, the, there's a couple of things you look at in Chapter 13, and, and one of the things you look at is, if I didn't file Chapter 13, but I went into the bankruptcy court, what would the, that creditor get? Right? Uh, and then you propose your plan to say, my plan will give the creditor no less than that. And it gives you the opportunity to uh, propose a plan where the, one of the other requirements for a plan is that each class of creditor has to be treated the same. Uh, and there, there's a little bit of nuance to that, but the idea is uh, you can't say I'm going to pay this unsecured creditor but not that one. You have to pay them all the same or pay them nothing. And uh, that, that's, that's the idea. If you're going to pay fully on your secured, secured claims, you have to pay fully on your secured claims to all secured creditors. Question. Hi. Yes. Um, how does that affect when, for example, some loans that I've taken or uh, credit cards, I have a relative or a friend that has signed on with me good. and I declare bankruptcy, Very I mean, good. how does that affect them? One of the things you always have to consider if there's a co-debtor, because the bankruptcy will relieve you, but it may not relieve that other person. Uh, yes, in, in Chapter 7, uh, there is no relief for co-debtors. So if, if you go through a Chapter 7 bankruptcy and get a discharge which says, basically we didn't talk about this, but what a discharge is is really it's an order of the bankruptcy court directed to your creditors that says you are now legally not permitted to collect this debt anymore. Right? That discharge in a Chapter 7 applies only to you. One of the advantages of a Chapter 13 bankruptcy is if you commit yourself to a payment plan, even if there's a co-debtor, while the Chapter 13 plan is in effect, the creditors cannot try to collect from the co-debtor. So the 13 protects the co-debtor. Yeah. You can see the court has a lot of power to work out a payment plan that works for you and tell your creditors they have to accept it. It's the main power of a bankruptcy court. Is, do you know anything is about, if, is there a certain like time period after bankruptcy that, I don't know, that it takes to reestablish your credit that you, you know, that you're not yeah. looked? Well, there's a couple different things. You can start borrowing money immediately after bankruptcy. You can start buying things immediately after bankruptcy. There's nothing that prevents you from doing it. You may find, though, that certain kinds of credit are closed down. For example, if you go to buy a home and go to a bank, they may decide that because you've gone through bankruptcy, you're not a good enough credit risk. You may find that things you want to buy, you may have to buy at a higher interest rate. But you certainly can negotiate and purchase anything you want immediately after bankruptcy and borrow as much money as at whatever rate you can get after bankruptcy. Now, the only catch with that is if you're in a Chapter 13 plan, because you've probably committed most of your money to settling out that, those special debts that you want in order to protect your property. Um, a couple of things on that also. The fact of filing a bankruptcy remains on your credit record for a long time. I believe it's 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and that may or may not have impact. On the upside, there are uh, protections sort of in the bankruptcy law which are supposedly to protect you from discrimination on account of the filing of the bankruptcy. But given the nature of the beast, uh, it's, I mean, the, the fact that there is a record that says you have not paid is going to be a consideration in the extension of new credit, theoretically. So, I mean, there's, there's no set time frame. And again, um, in today's market of easy credit, I have had bankruptcy clients tell me that even before they've gotten their discharge, they're being solicited for new credit cards. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the wisdom of doing that is one question, but the availability right. is, is another, and it's not, it's not time dependent at all. Let me talk another area that's pretty important, though, and that's uh, when you come to utilities. Sometimes people run up phone bills, or they run up, let's say, uh, an electricity debt or things like that. You can discharge that debt in bankruptcy, but if that's the only service provider in your area, 
they may still need to deliver services to you. Now, they can require a security deposit to protect them. And the other thing that protects them is the fact that you can't go bankrupt again for another seven years. <clears throat> How difficult is it to file? I mean, is there like an uh, application process, or how does one go about declaring bankruptcy? Once, once you get the basic idea of how bankruptcy works for you and whether it is a remedy that works for you, uh, the actual paperwork to start a bankruptcy is pretty simple. Any attorney can run it off in an afternoon, have you sign it. Uh, there's usually a $30 filing fee as a starting fee and that can start the process. Once again, the key thing of the process is it, it stops any collection actions against you. So for example, if you came in and said there's a sheriff sale to, you know, in, in two days, uh, a bankruptcy could be filed in time to stop the sale. We prefer a lot more notice than that, of course. The and, thing. And I want to follow up on that. Um, I think Gary was talking about the actual petition in bankruptcy, which mm -hmm. is only a two-page document. Right. Uh, which is basically a, a, a form that you just sign that says, I want relief from the bankruptcy court. Uh, the follow-up, on the other hand, is rather extensive. It takes a lot of time and preparation to do because it's a very extensive look at your financial situation. The name of the game in bank bankruptcy is, this is an extraordinary remedy, and if you're going to get an extraordinary remedy, uh, you're going to tell us a lot about yourself. Uh, right. And there's a lot of information that has to be disclosed. In fact, what the court's really asking for is a complete financial disclosure. Once they get this complete financial disclosure, and it's the attorney's job to help you gather that and put it together. There's a, uh, it's presented to a trustee in the bankruptcy. He's an attorney whose job it is to go through the bankruptcy petition, go through the paperwork, and make sure there's a full disclosure, and then see how the law is going to affect you given, the, given your financial situation. The, the trustee's job is actually to be the representative of creditors to see if there is not some uh, payment that can be made from your stuff, your bankrupt estate, to the creditors. Um, there's another thing I wanted to say. I think I just lost track of it. Uh, oh, I was, it's something that Gary had mentioned in an earlier session. Filing a bankruptcy is like taking a picture of your finances on the day that your papers are filed. I mean, you're, you're, you're moving in time. You have income coming in, you have things going out for utilities and whatever. Uh, if you think about taking a snapshot of your financial situation, that's the picture that the bankruptcy is based on, and that's what's frozen. Uh, so when you buy things after the bankruptcy, they're not affected. Debt that you incur after the bankruptcy is not part of your bankruptcy. It's up to the time. It's one catch. If you do win the lottery within 180 days after, or if you inherit large sums of money or receive other kinds of awards, that money is then part of the bankruptcy estate and it can be used to, to pay your creditors. So you're obligated to report that to the court if any of that should happen. Um, could I, would I get into any trouble if I gave any things of value that I have to family members or friends to hold for me? Yes. One of the things you're asked to do is disclose right up front. Have you made any unusual payments? Have you made any unusual gifts within usually looking at the year before the bankruptcy is filed? And the court certainly can step in if they think you've made some transfers just to protect property from creditors and undo the transfer. I had a conversation with my father last night and I told him that I was considering uh, filing for bankruptcy and he says that the only people that seem to benefit from going bankrupt are people that had money to begin with, people that were rich to begin with. So how true is that statement? Well, we, what we usually see is the people who benefit are those who've fallen in the hard times for some loss of, again, loss of work for some reason, and are, run the risk of losing the assets they've managed to pull together, a house, a car, you know, basic household goods. For those people, a bankruptcy can give them a fresh start and can be very valuable. Yeah, I, uh, I see that really as a question of timing because a lot of times uh, people come to us when they're on the financial decline and say, I want to file bankruptcy. And unless there's something uh, really critical that we can protect by filing a bankruptcy, I discourage them from filing a bankruptcy until they've sort of hit bottom and are sort of on the upswing again. Because the, the idea of a bankruptcy is to give you a fresh start 
and not to leave the things that you accumulate at risk to your creditors. So in, in that sense, there's a little bit of wisdom in what your dad is saying because you want to be on the upswing when you file bankruptcy if you possibly can. Because if, if you accumulate a lot of debt and then you start to improve your, your circumstances, the things you accumulate are going to be vulnerable to the claims of creditors. But if at the bottom of that curve where you're starting to come up again, if you file bankruptcy then, then you get your fresh start because then you're free to use your earnings for your own purposes, reinvesting re, re, uh, your estate, as it were. Best example would be a house where you fall behind on the mortgage payments because there's been an, un, an interruption in your income. If you want to save that house, you've got to show the bankruptcy court you have enough income to not only pay the current mortgage, but to catch up on the arrearages. Clearly, to do that, you have to have got yourself back in a position where you have income coming in to do that. So you, if you go into bankruptcy court falling behind on the house and have no income because you've lost work or whatever, you're going to lose the house. Well, I have the question in regards to the house, which is what worries me because sure. that's my major asset per sure. se. Um, if I go and file under bankrupt um, chapter 13 mm -hmm. and I have the house and they say that my salary, all my other credit you know, credit card debts are stopped mm -hmm. because my salary just gives me enough to live and pay my living expenses, right. which will be the mortgage and utilities. Right. Um, down the road, and if I want to refinance or if I want to do something with the house, I mean, how is that affected? Because now I have this label that I have filed bankruptcy, even though I have the home, you know, can I do anything with it? Well, I, I would, uh, what, you, what I think is uh, a key to what you're saying is the Chapter 13 is really a refinancing uh, because you, uh, assuming that you're going into the bankruptcy with any kind of uh, backlog on your payments, that has to be paid in the Chapter 13. In fact, that's depending on, because the Chapter 13 plan is geared to last no more than five years, say you're maybe $1,000 behind on your mortgage, but now are able to keep the regular payments up. If you pay that $1,000 over up to five years, it's a very small monthly payment, right? If you were to go to a bank and say, I want to refinance my mortgage to catch up on what I've fallen behind on, because you've fallen behind, the banks are going to say, no, we won't lend to you anymore. But you can go into the bankruptcy court and effectively force a refinancing with your existing creditor by having the arrears that you've accumulated be liquidated over the, the plan period. Right? I, I don't know if I'm responding to your question, uh, but you are doing the refinancing in the Chapter 13 yeah. bankruptcy. Your, your, uh, when the bankruptcy concludes, then uh, if you need to refinance again or wish to refinance again, you should be uh, able to do that depending on non-bankruptcy related factors such as your steady income and, and expenses or any, any, any circumstances that might affect the borrowing outside of bankruptcy. So I have to, I have to go through that time frame sure. that the, the court you know, the, um, says it's five years, and after five years, then I can refinance whichever once I want. Again, the credit, the cre any creditor can loan you money at any time. Having good credit is better than going through bankruptcy. There's no doubt. And being able to be in that situation where you maintain good credit so you can get the best rates is the best way to deal with things financially. Bankruptcy is there when you're backed into a corner that you need that remedy to save special property. The the time factor at the bankruptcy is a Chapter 13 plan usually must go 36 months. Uh, it's permissive up to 60 months with the bankruptcy court. All right? So, I mean, if you can do it in 36 months, that's great. If you need 60 months, that's available to you. All right? The, in a liquidation bankruptcy, the discharge order is issued probably about six months after you file. In the Chapter 13 bankruptcy, the discharge order is not issued until you complete the plan. Or in some, uh, if there's some other 
uh, calamity that occurs during the course of the plan, you may be entitled to a Chapter 13 hardship discharge before the, the term of the plan runs. But the discharge is, as I mentioned earlier, like a court order that uh, directs the creditors not to take any steps to collect on any of the debts that was treated within the Chapter 13 plan. I, I don't know if that's making sense to you, but that's that's kind of the idea of the, the, the discharge is the, the, the point of timing. Once you receive the discharge, then you're again out of the bankruptcy court's jurisdiction and you're operating again in the, in the non-bankruptcy uh, environment. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Sir. Sure. Um, when they talk about income, is it only the income that comes from employment? Like if I receive child support or alimony, things like that, everything is going to be included? Right. When you work out the budget, what they're looking at is a steady income. So if your income is from employment and child support or employment and some other regular kinds of checks, for example, people on disability can still go and file for bankruptcy and have the protection of the bankruptcy court. If that income is enough, the disability income, to have them make certain payments. If I have to declare bankruptcy, mm -hmm. and a few years down the road when my son is ready to go to college, will it affect him when it comes to financial aid in any way? Good question. Do you want the answer on that one? Um, no, I, well, I've never really ex experienced that as a question, but it would, it would seem to me that is, it goes back to the same kind of uh, poles of position that we had mentioned earlier. Uh, certainly the fact that you were unable to pay certain debts is going to be a negative factor if your son is trying to get financial aid, for example, um, or uh, I, might, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, I haven't really considered it. What a great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, on, on the one hand, the fact of a bankruptcy would be an indication that there's need. So, uh, really, I guess... But, but I don't know. I mean, the worst thing that ever happened to me was the couple who came back after bankruptcy and found out that they couldn't get a loan for a house, you know? Because the bankruptcy, you know, just uh, was on the record and a bank wouldn't trust them. Now, I don't know on the student loans. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm sort of... There's two kinds of financial aid, I guess. There's, you know, the scholarship idea, in which case a bankruptcy may say, this this uh, bright young fellow needs a scholarship because his dad went through bankruptcy. Now, if you're going for student aid that is a loan, you're going to have, who's going to repay this loan? That's, it may, there may be an impact there. Oh, if I can go back to something else. Sure. I, I was wondering, can the bankruptcy process, Chapter 13, um, help me with my landlord? You know, things get tough and you get slightly behind, but not completely. Mm -hmm. uh, off the rec off the track. This is a, going to take us into a. It's a it, landlords are special creatures under the bankruptcy law, because they have what's called in, in the bankruptcy court language, executory contracts, which means that's a contract that has performance on both sides, that goes forward in time. After you file bankruptcy, your landlord is going to provide you a place to live and you are going to pay your landlord. Right? Because of that relationship, uh, landlords have certain rights. If you go into a bankruptcy owing your landlord two or three thousand dollars, you're going to be evicted in a bankruptcy. The landlord will have to do it through the bankruptcy court, but he's going to succeed or she's going to succeed in doing that. If you're going into the bankruptcy with your rent current and your landlord is a good chum, uh, you'll probably continue to live there. Um, I've heard some stories that, that people are refused, um, uh, they can't rent an apartment or a house because of their past credit history. Is that, if I declare bankruptcy, is that something that could happen to me? Well, this is a, a recurring theme that we seem to be visiting, and uh, there's an upside and a downside. In a certain sense, if you've lost a lot of debt, you may be a good credit risk. The downside is, if you weren't able to pay your debts before, you may be someone who's not going to pay his debts in the future, and therefore I don't want to rent to you. 
or I don't want to you know, lend you money. That is uh, a decision that is up to the lender or the landlord, and although there are certain protections against discrimination on the basis of bankruptcy, there are probably factors that that person can point to to justify a decision either way. Landlords typically consider credit history of people before they decide to rent to them. If they think they're not good at paying their debts and that they might get stiffed on the rent, they can refuse to rent to someone. So I would have to disclose that on an application form if I'm asked? Well, have if I you lie on an application form, you always get in trouble if it's found out. Okay. All right, I think that's about all we have time for tonight, and I want to thank you for coming. Again, how a bankruptcy affects you individually will depend on your own financial circumstances. These are general, general discussions and general points. And what you'll want to do if you want to go forward is do a complete financial picture, sit down with someone who can give you specific advice based on your specific circumstances. But uh, other than that, thank you for coming.